bohemian girl. That's me in the 19th century. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to read from you, uh, to you in chapter 19, which uh, in honor of the Sam Queen, it's about uh, kind of post-war, post-traumatic stress. Uh, that is to say, it's uh, a celebration of the Nebraskan statehood right after the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> To celebrate the statehood, women lay dozens of pies, meat, and fruit on one end of the tables in town pushed together, and leave her kegs of drink onto the other end. The men are forced to bathe for the event, which they maintain is truly ridiculous. How is that political? Their wives and mothers trim their mustaches and beards and polish their buttons and find shoes for them that make them look as if they had marched into churches instead of battles. Many of the men take to giving and receiving kisses while all this is being done, some of the statehood beer having been leaked from the caves. Thus the women are reminded of how much they miss them while they were warring, and how fearful they were falls out of their lips, or else they get short with them with all their feelings laid out like that. I remember the drummer boy at the fort and turn a cracker tin into a drum that the shortest of the veterans takes. But I have to show him how to hold the stick side smooth. I have to beat out a rat-a-tat-tat for him. I only stole cattle, he tells me. I was good for that and as a prisoner. He doesn't have the soldier's disease, wanting only to smoke ground wild poppy. And he turns out to be one of the best eaters. <coughs> I am shocked by how many of the returnees do not match their relatives' descriptions. Some of it is in their size. Described as barrel chested the men turn up deflated, unstaved. Do the women or the children or the old parent remember them wrong? The cheerful ones sing melancholy airs, and the melancholy tell jokes. A rogue brother appears out of the prairie for the party, and he is so steady out of his usual ways that a sister takes him in with not so much as a tubaloo. Even more shocking are the women and the children who stay and starve whom the men don't recognize. But all of the men congratulate themselves on themselves surviving, backslapping, and cajoling, as if the survival is solely on their own account. Must be the strongest and cleverest, that family of six boys, all of them back, but one look and you see that none of them could muster the courage to flush a wood pile for badgers. <laughs> but not all of the returnees feign bravery. Some of the bravest could be wearing skirts. They fear even the sound of the axe, let alone the blast of the cannon, the plenty shoot off for the statehood, the band playing in between the volleys. Some of them can't figure out why they came back at all, and parade with their arms stiff at their sides and not around their wives. Others lift half-grown calves to show off what strength they returned with. A couple are loud about the women they fought off elsewhere, but all of them, brave or not, volunteered. That the statehood struggled to pass, having senators wanting to keep the vote of those only of their own race, until the president himself put in his objections, is nothing they want to discuss. I'm glad the slaves are free. She's a slave of the before all the feasting, we play croquet in the wheat stubble, the cut rows making it harder on the cross shots, but easier to hit the ball home. Every step rains grasshoppers. Afterwards, the horses throw off their shoes in the heat, and two men compete throwing them at stakes beside the weighted tables, even heavier now that they're laden with slow roasted haunches and the parts of chickens. All this food is remembered by count for decades. So many mock apple pies, so many legs of beef, and enough secret bottles and flasks beside the kegs under the table that no one knows how all the speeches, also counted, were ever finished. <clears throat> Men with sashes cut from cloth and colors so gaudy I couldn't sell them anyway, stand and repeat themselves in the style of the day, ornately with the vigor of new affirmation. Listeners beat their spoons at every grand army of the Republic, but louder when the dead president's name greets their ears as the choice for the new state capitals 
two days ride away. Even Henry rises. Henry's a bow. Even Henry rises and tells about his serving the country as a cook. First, he warms up the subject with on Bortamore, the great hunger that brought him and his mother over from their country, shorn of their every relative, and how this spread of food here proves he emigrated for the good. He pokes his hand out toward the fly-laden empty rashers and scraped tin pots, and how half the shade tales he fought with weren't speaking of weren't speakers of English at all, but had struck the continent with about the same luck that he had at about the same time, one war or another being what they were really good for, except for the eating. Old tar, they called me, he says, on account of the supplies I used, and, of course, the taste of my cooking. Someone tells him to sit down, he is putting the fear of food into them, and for the first time, I see a smile split his whiskers.